daytime sunshine upon you All love surround you and the pure light within you guide you Time sunshine upon you, all oh, love surround you, and the pure light within you guide your way on. May the long time sunshine upon you, all oh, love surround you, and the pure light within you guide your way. Sunshine upon you, oh love, surround you, and the pure light within you guide your way on. First of all, thank you so much, Luke, for being here and playing and we're going to hear more later so it's a great pleasure to have you all here and I really hope you enjoy the day and I'm pretending to be Janelle Safran <laughs> who somehow couldn't make it you know how it is so you know um, that could be another job sometime uh, so it's really you know wonderful to be here and I acknowledge the country that we stand on and the elders past present and future and um and I honour you all for surviving what you've been through and I hope you find the day both sort of pleasurable and sad and lovely to be together and it's lovely to join you all in this. So I'd love to introduce Jackie Wagner who's done these wonderful photographs that we're about to see and she'll introduce them for you. Thank you for coming. Um. Okay, well, hello everyone. There's a lot of faces here I recognise um, and know now and who were part, part of the exhibition that's now at New South Wales Parliament House until next week when I'll go down and take it back, take it down and bring it home. So I'll just, um, I'll just do an outline as to kind of how it, how it all happened. Um, thanks, Dave. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, thank you. So I've lived in Lismore for 40 years and I worked at the Northern Star uh, for 20 years and, and I finished up there about nine, nine years ago. So floods were always actually kind of a major news event and um, where I live um, the house is fine but the road gets blocked. And I always made it my business to kind of stay in town because, in a way, it was quite an exciting time um, and very newsworthy. This year, um, I mean, when, when this flood happened, I, I was actually up the coast. Um, I needed to be up the coast. My daughter was expecting a baby, so we left on the Wednesday and watched the flood from afar. So we returned a week later and joined the, the Mud Army. I had my brother-in-law um, and another friend, Victoria Lane, who's here, um, and joined, joined the Mud Army. I thought, I was thinking whilst all that was happening, and it was, it was like a war zone, that there would be something I should do. I, I love photo documentary work, but I decided I would just let it come to me. Um, which I did. So on the third week, I woke up one morning and went, I've got it. I know what I have to do. And uh, so I defined it as basically people who owned their own homes um, and were at that point of wanting to reconnect with their homes. Not, not move in because that generally, well, that certainly wasn't possible, but they were reconnecting. They were <clears throat> cleaning up. Um, and starting, I guess, starting to look, to look forward. 
Anyway, so I went out that day and the first woman I came across was in Engine Street. She was sitting in her car and I said, look, I, I don't know where this will go, but I know it's important to do um, and I will keep you abreast as to what's happening. And she went, I understand. So that gave me the, I don't know, the, the okay to go ahead. So each day for three months, most days, um, I went out and on some days I'd, I'd photograph three or four people, sometimes two. And it was just a matter of, you could see when there was someone at home, there was generally a vehicle there. Um, you couldn't always tell just by windows and doors being opened because that's how they were. There wasn't necessarily anyone at home. So over that, over that three months, I photographed people in their houses as they were the, the day that I came. There were a couple of exceptions where um, Victoria was a friend and she knew I was coming. <clears throat> and they were done very simply. I had one camera, one lens, a notepad and a pen. And uh, there were no lights. They were all using natural lighting. And what I did was I actually um, spoke to them and having a newspaper background, I definitely got their details, correct spelling, etc., etc. What I was after, I think, was what was here, what they were, what they were feeling here. And it was what people said that actually um, highlighted that. And they weren't things like, I'm feeling devastated. They were um, one of the sayings, one of the quotes which go with the images now in the exhibition. One lady said she'd lost everything. And she said, I can't believe it. I went out after I returned and a day later I found my father's soccer whistle. I'm so glad I found that. And I thought, like, that's, a, that's the quote. Because what it did was symbolise humans wanting to make the best out of a horrible situation. And, and I think that's a great testimony to human, humankind, basically. So what happened after that was um, I kept on going <laughs> and um, every day... I would come back home and write down what I had got. And I didn't take copious amount of notes. Um, being a photographer, I didn't particularly want to be text heavy. <laughs> Photographers like the image. Um, and I got a phone call from a friend of mine um, who just said, how, you know, how are you going? What are you doing? And I told him what I was working on. And he said, ah. He said, I've actually got the Mayor of Lismore staying with me, who's lost his house and his business. He's going to Sydney. Why don't you get some images together and he can take them down? And I went, wow, oh, what a great idea. Anyway, so I went to visit my sister in the Southern Highlands, got in touch with Officeworks at Mittagong and said, can you put some photos together for me in a day? And they did. Uh, flew back to Lismore quickly went and met the mayor, who I hadn't met before, and said, you've got to give these to the Premier. <laughs> and you've also got to give them to the Prime Minister. Which he did, and he sent me a photo. So that was really good. And then four days later, I got, um, I got a letter from the Premier, Dominic Perrottet. Um, and I, I knew he'd actually really looked at the image, and he was on my page. Um, and what he saw was what I saw. Um, so that gave me the opportunity to move further forward. Ultimately, I ended up through um, the work of Janelle Safin, who um, I kind of stopped at the markets one day. I was able to get a Premier's discretionary grant and an arts grant, and that enabled me to have an exhibition at Parliament House, a small exhibition, of 25 images in November of 22, and then the full 100 image exhibition, which is at Parliament House now. Um, and that has given the whole, the whole, the whole exhibition has actually given it, my, you know, legs. So we've, we've, there's an article in today's Sydney Morning Herald, it's probably the third, 
Um, there's been ABC articles. Um, and there's actually also a book now. And all of this has come through the generosity of people far and wide. Um, and that was, that was kind of my aim, one of the aims of doing this work, is that not only is it historical, not only was the incident profound, um, but it needed doing. And I defined a certain part of it, um, and, you know, other people have done other things, hopefully. Um, and I think... Like, I think, I think it's been a really good healing thing. It hasn't made anything better, but it certainly kept it in the face of authorities and the people with money, <laughs> which is what all of this ultimately takes. Um, I mean, it would be lovely to hear from someone who's in the exhibition to see how, how what their take on being part of this has been for them. Look, I'm just so grateful. Nobody said no. Uh, one person did say no and then came back to me, so that was good. Um, but I think those 100 people, there are a couple of people who have two images. So in actual fact, there's probably more than 100 people and there's about 97 households. I think you have actually been representative of the thousands that have experienced directly what you found happened to you. Um, also, the community has, has felt it enormously and, and the country has felt it. The country can't be allowed to forget. Um, there is a long way to go. There isn't a right way of dealing with it. Um, and it's, it's probably also now starting to enter an historical stage. Um, you couldn't go and do those now. So, um, that's, I've had enormous help. Um, it's, the whole thing has been a labour of love. Um, people like Jenny Dell up the back, she wrote a beautiful piece about the night of the flood. Um, she corrected all my captions and put commas in right places. And so we, we've had a... Um, and Jenny gave me my first job with a newspaper <laughs> many years ago. So it's been really lovely to incorporate her into... This. I mean, it's reached a premier's department. The book has been half funded by Nick on Australia, um, and also a really um, a primary school friend of mine of 60 years. So you've got these, you've got these amazing kind of extremes of people that have helped. I know, to, I know here today there are people from Terrania Creek. Um, and I know that your experiences have probably been slightly different or the same. I don't know whether you've had anyone who's um, documented, you know, what, is, what has happened to, happened to you. I think any images that you've taken, any stories you have, are really important. Next week when I go to Sydney, I've got a meeting with New South Wales Library about them actually... Um, keeping as a permanent document what, what I have got. Um, I've included the Premier's speech, Janelle Safin's speech, anyone who had any involvement. Uh, and I have everyone's <laughs> I have everyone's details so that in 20, 30 years' time, um, assuming you've all got the same phone number and email, <laughs> you'll all be traceable. But I think that's... That's actually a, um, that's a really important thing that it's a body of work. Um, and everyone I photographed understood that. It wasn't just like a photograph of you, but you're part of, and I have kept in touch with everyone regularly, probably driven them a little bit crazy with every little thing, but I think they've appreciated that. Um, do you want to actually start flicking through some of the images? Um, and anyone who's here, I've made sure you are here as well. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, any questions? But maybe just, 
Maybe just flick through some of them now. Yep. I mean, I, I'm happy to answer questions as, that's, as that is happening. Um, we do have a second mic too for the audience oh, because okay. it's um, difficult yeah. to hear sometimes. That, that might be a nice... Um, should I move over to the side yeah, here? I'm not going to pull anything out, am I? I just don't want to stand. Sorry, Luke. Um, I selected some of the images here and I did bring a, a copy of the book just to show everyone and we're having a little launch in Lismore. Um, as far as the book goes, uh, three businesses would benefit from that. The graphic designer, Lismore Printery and the new camera house who lost everything, um, uh, you know, along with other businesses. So this is a little bit of an injection for them and um, that's been nice to do as well. Okay. So there's, there's not a hundred images here. I thought that might be a bit of overkill. But, um, and perhaps when we stop it, anyone who's here, they might be happy to say something about where they're at now or what, what's been happening. This one here, I probably took 10 images, 10 shots. They were busy, they were having jip rocking redone. Um, so I didn't spend a lot, a lot of time. And I really love this because it's like a family portrait, really, without walls. Yeah, Gloria, she, she sort of was on her, a woman on her own, hung at her window, trying to get attention, you know, when no one could really... Um, you can see by the look on her face. And these were done, you know, between three and 12, 12 weeks after the fact. So, yep. Next. Yeah, maybe we can do a slideshow. Um, this little girl, actually, she came to the exhibition, Peyton. She ended up on a roof and sitting on a chair on a table that started to float. And she'd um, thrown her uh, favourite toys into a backpack, unbeknownst to her mum. And she threw, threw the backpack up onto a cupboard. But when, it, when we were at the exhibition, she got to know me a bit. And she'd go, hi, Jacqueline. And I saw her at the airport when we got back. And she went, hi, Jacqueline. And I went, Peyton, are you feeling a little bit famous? And she went, yeah, kind of. <laughs> so for her, it was a lovely experience being at Parliament House, um, having... Dominic Perrottet pour drinks for all the kids and stuff like that. So, you know, yeah. Oh, she took it to Sydney with her. Well, see, that's, yeah. So th the other thing about this is um, in terms of historically, there's lots of children who, who are in my photos who are actually in the flood who... One day they're going to be young adults who will talk about that experience. Um, so when we've gone, they will definitely. Um, Kirsty, um, they had they bought the old presbytery in in um, North Lismore, and she's had a she's had a terrible time. She wouldn't mind me saying it, but just coping with what has happened. A dreadful time with insurance. They beautiful mahogany floors. You know, it's a Catholic church building, and they got to the, and they went stop. Um, but anyway, Kirsty came to the exhibition, and there was a really she was um, she's been highly emotional during all of this. But afterwards, when we went out, she came to a group of us when we were at the Cabana Bar in Martin Place, and she said, "I've got some good news. It didn't happen tonight." 
put out a hand and she said, I'm engaged. Uh, and her face lit up and we all cheered. So that was probably for her to actually share good news alone. That was enormous. Um, yeah, so, and I think they're, they're, they're going to move on. Yeah, that's their decision. Yep. Uh, Lee lives in uh, Engine Street and his artwork is just prolific. I mean, the house was just absolutely amazing. I've never seen room after room. Um, he ended up with a, um, a cow, a dead cow in the frangipani tree outside his window. Um, yeah. But he's quite philosophical. Sorry? And it is the old broom factory, yes. Yeah, but, um, oh, just amazing artwork. Fantastic. Um, I think sometimes people who, from this, who have been involved in arts have, have been able to be a bit more philo philosophical. Simon actually never thought he'd have a home. Um, and he was left some money and basically this was his first home. He hasn't had it very long, so it's been pretty... That's been... That, that's happened in a few cases where people have not long had their home and, um, and have faced with this, but I think he's getting back on top of it. Yep. Yeah, there you go. He's loving his house. And here we've got Andrew. Andrew's here. And Andrew, um, he left, he, yeah, it's, he, there's a little bit of humour in here as well. He left with Eric, uh, the dog. They didn't have much else to leave with. They had a chicken called Carlotta, put her in a cage up on the rafters, came back and she'd laid four eggs. <laughs> so, Andrew, I don't know whether you would... No, I don't know. Oh, have you, is there a microphone for... Hang on. So Eric's um. So Andrew's photo has actually been been used quite a bit in different media things, and uh, um, yeah, so uh, he's he's become famous a bit like Peyton and and the toys. But has this been good for you being part of this, or? Uh, yeah, it's it's been an experience, like um, whenever I do see the photo show and I, yeah, it, um, I feel happy that it's there and that people are actually seeing what we've all been through. Okay. And um, I mean like that, that day all I got out with was Eric and, and the torch and I still have him and I still have the torch and I'm glad that, you know, we all survived that day. And, to be honest, I don't think I've really got over it properly. I've, I've just been too busy building the house and and trying to get some piece of normality back. And is that starting to happen for you, or? Uh, it's yeah, it's it's uh, it's a confusing thing. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm happy that the house is there, but at the same time, I'm still undecided on a lot of stuff and and yeah. how things are panning out. Yep. 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 Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. This lady here was quite new to Lismore. She'd never experienced a flood before. She fell in love with the house that she bought. She hadn't been in it, um, you know, that long. She, she, was, um, she, she was evacuated from the house. Um, and I thought it was quite profound. She described seeing 62 years of her life on the street um, was... Um, she was insured. The house, house had all been stripped. She actually gave me a call the other day and um, she's quite happy with where she's... Back. I will, I'll drop in and see her at some stage. But she kept saying to me, Jacqueline, there were things floating in my yard because she'd never seen a flood before. Um, and she said if it wasn't for her neighbours who had had experience with floods in the area, she wouldn't have had a clue what was going on. Um, 
But amongst all this, there were chandeliers still there. And <laughs> you know, she, she was quite devastated. Yep. Next. That was just another one of Jamie. They weren't back in the house. Um, they were, you know, a lot of people were just coming back to to deal with things, and um, you know, like even even towards the end of it, houses that had actually got a PowerPoint was, you know, that was that was that was pretty profound. Um, some people were back in. Uh, I was talking before, like my brother-in-law, he was in North Lismore and a huge family, lots of, you know, electricians, plumbers, whatever, that made a really big difference. But not everyone had, had that kind of luxury. Um, yeah, next. So uh, Lorraine and Trev had moved back in, but this was a, you can see all the walls inside had gone, everything is stored as high as it can. Um, it looks like the flood probably got up to their, you know, to their, to their doorway, but they, they were, when I took this photo, they lost all their musical instruments um, and record collection. Um, but they were quite, quite philosophical and definitely love their home in South Lismore. Margaret and Barry, um, oh, my heart went out to them. That was earlier in the piece. And I saw them about two weeks ago and like everything is just totally transformed and you can see how long they've lived there by the marks, you know, the fading on the wall. All the, every, they've got things all back in those places and they've done it all themselves. And they were just a, a beautiful couple um, and he had the most amazing vegetable garden and feed, feeds the street and he's back doing that now. So they... Um, they're, they're very, uh, they're just on a totally different plane now. They're, they're great, which is good to see. Um, but she, when I, the day I photographed them, she just looked at me and cried and said, he thinks he can fix it all himself and he can't. But he seems to have <laughs> done a pretty good job of it. Um, and they've lived there for decades um, and not a lot of family at all. Um, don't have email, you know, they're, they're sort of, um, yeah, but anyway, I was, I was able to get them some help and everything, which was really good, yeah, but they're good now, they're very happy. And Simon, um, everyone in Lismore knows Simon. He used to actually run Carrington Bazaar. Um, and he's a great, you know, he really knows his work. He's a great collector um, of, of everything, but particularly paper and, um, you know, just to a very highly specialised degree. And his house in Union Street was, this was just one of the rooms where he... he you know the parasols and everything he's collected. He had a he had a he had a profound awful rescue, um, and he definitely thought his that was his last day. And his family who live in New Zealand, it says here like he dropped his phone and they lost contact with him for nine hours. Um, he eventually went back to New Zealand, uh, and I think he's been back a couple of times and still undecided as to his family wanting back in New Zealand. Um, so he's in a, still in a state of flux, but he's back in his house. Um, some beautiful, yeah, yeah. I think it was very, very frightening for him. Uh, 
Um, and Johnny was um, just someone who was there on the day I went and um, he's very much kind of the caretaker of his street. So, you know, he's, he was very much, very much aware of um, how, how, how everyone else was feeling. Um, and apart from looking after himself and his home, which he called the old girl, um, loved his house, he was also um, very much aware of, of everyone else's needs around, which was very much the way it was generally in Lismore. People were very concerned um, and drew on their, their particular strengths, um, which is... I don't think we've ever... Ha we've never had a disaster like that, and I know they happen all over the world, and... Um, it's sort of, I don't know, there's something, there's something nice to think about, about the way people were, in actual fact. Not that you wouldn't want it to happen, but, yep. Sorry? Oh, some of them I can remember off the, off the top of my head. Um, this one is actually off Cassin Wilson Street um, and Katie came to the first exhibition and she spoke on um, the ABC radio. They did a um, put together a piece from the first and the second exhibition which they played the following day on the radio which was really beautiful um, and Katie spoke at the, at the first one and um, oh, just what she said was was really heartfelt but she she said to me that night um, there's a similar look on everyone's faces in this and I, I kind of recognized it particularly as I got towards the end of it um, and she said to me we just all look lost and I thought that that was exactly um, so if you see the images there is this particular state of mind or a similarity, and I think everyone does look lost. Yeah, um, she had a great night. Um, <laughs> I think she really, she really regretted not being able to take a. Pla uh, um, the first one we went to, um, we were, they provided a dinner in the restaurant at Parliament House because there was only five people who went with their partners. And Katie said, I wish I would have been able to get a Parliament House plate as a memory because it, <laughs> it, it had the logo on it. Would have been nice if she could have, maybe, <laughs> as a memento. Eh? Hey? <laughs> when you tried, did you? <laughs> OK. OK. Um, yeah, so um, Deb and Cass, uh, Deb owns the... Um, a record shop in town and um, they haven't been back to their home. Um, they won't be going back. Um, they just have lost a bit of trust in their home and I guess that, that is the case for certain people. Um, I haven't followed up on uh, what, people situ what the situation is and a lot has happened since then and I don't really want to. I don't, I don't want to do any more. I just want to um, protect, you know, what I've done. It's, it's, a, it's just a piece of history. And, and I think other places um, and people can follow that up. And I have had a couple of inquiries, like yesterday, from ABC Radio. No, and they know that, you know, there is this body of work and there is an understanding and, and um, you know, what people might be doing. And I'm happy to pass that on and they can be free to, free to talk about it all. But I, I, I personally don't want to do the next stage at all. Like, I'm, I just want to look after this one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I really, I, I love this photo. So Jill is a... Um, uh, she lives in Kyo Kyogle Street, yes, um, and she's really resourceful and uh, philosophical and has her artwork and she's had a lot of the house done out in wrought iron and a wrought iron ceiling. I'm not quite sure where she's... At. Her house is low set as well, so 
Um, I guess if there were another, even a minor flood, um, it would probably get in. So whether, I'm not quite sure where she's at with that. Yep. Um, but it looks a lot different now. She's an interesting woman, Jill. Tell me if this is getting too much for you. So this is um, Matt and Katrina, and they live in Casino, Casino Street. Um, and they ha there were two images of them. The other one was they have two really, really big dogs who are their babies. They couldn't get them into the roof. Um, and eventually... Katrina was rescued with the two big dogs um, and Matt describes, uh, it's in the other photo, he was on his own there and he definitely felt very vulnerable and that something could easily, easily happen to him but it didn't and he was safe and they lived in a, a bus down their driveway for many months with a heart on the front. And um, Mundi, Mundi's here, um, and this is a, yeah, I, this was Mundi, and when I, when I walked down her driveway that day, she was, um, yeah, like, and I love, I love her comment that doing this was actually a cathartic thing to do, you know, saving, saving her journal, there's something, there's something very sad about it. About, about that image, but it's just beautiful. <laughs> but I don't know, Mundi, would you like to say anything? Oh, she, where is she? You don't want to? No, that, you don't have to. Oh, well, you have to say that louder. <laughs> I guess I'll say something. Okay. Um, it's been wonderful to be a part of the journey with Jacqueline and uh, as she said earlier that when she walked in that she said that she didn't know what was going to happen but she knew that something was and, and I think it's really important what she has created and what all of the subjects have been a part of and what is now history has been very well documented and will will always be remembered, I guess, and it's important in this phase when a lot of people are still in limbo that it's a, a really good tool to to keep a, people visible and the town visible and to lobby, I guess, as well. Um, and Jacqueline has been incredibly supportive and has just created this amazing body of work, which I'm very proud to be a part of. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, yes, this was um, another place I went and, and Peter actually remembered me from, um, he used to work at City Hall, he used to be a, um, you know, a maintenance type, type person there. So that was really nice to create. Um, connect and like as he said I've got five sons like that was a, an absolute bonus um, and that's often you know was often the difference of um, moving forward and being stuck you know the, the help that you had um, yeah And Terry was, um, was quite a big house and there were three generations living in that house. He's very proud of his house. He's very proud of his wife's garden, which wasn't there. Um, and you can see, you know, which was 
you, you know, the salvaged family photos because that's basically what you're left with, uh, which was the case, yeah. which are watermarked and but there's no way you can still recognise the people and his Roy Orbison album and, you know, there's not much else there really. They were living in a caravan. Um, I'm not quite sure, but I, I think... I think they may be moving on, I think. Yeah, yeah. And he was in South Lismore and I can't think of the street. New Newbridge? Yep, okay. Um, and this is Nola. This is actually a different image that was in the book, but anyway, so the other one was her on a, her mother's vanity table, the only chair, the only thing left. But. Um, she ended up with this shipping container or no industrial fridge or whatever right at her back door and she was quite philosophical. She'd been in the house since she was married. She wasn't going anywhere. I don't know if she's back there. Her family was with her and um, that, eventually, that eventually got moved. But there were people who were quite um, nervous about things this size floating into or past their houses, you know, which quite easily have... Um, they, I came across a couple of people who were very anxious about that, about objects outside. Yep. I didn't know where it came from either. <laughs> like, that's, that's massive. Like, they're just absolutely massive. Okay, next one. I can just go to one people who are here if you want me to shorten this. Um, oh, okay. Okay. I can, yeah. Um, this was just a scene on um, someone's front. That was Engine Street. Yep, that one's Engine Street. Is that is that okay? Huh? Oh. Okay. Oh, okay. Then I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway. Um, Yes. Um, so I think they had rabbits, guinea pigs, dogs, whatever, all ended up in a boat, basically. Um, yeah. But she was uh, a lovely lady, Pat, yeah. Very grounded and, and from what I can gather, highly respected by the street. So that was good. She is. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, I really, I really loved this photo. This, I think, might have been in um, Crown Street or Crown, maybe. Anyway, um, as they said, this was their home. Um, their pets were buried in the backyard. I don't, I don't think that actually meant the pets. I think it just meant that sense of family history. I don't think they'd lost their pets in the flood, but you know, where you, that's what often what home is that um, I, and I really like that it's like a, a family portrait of a couple their kids weren't with them but the house is empty um, but there's they're so together like you can just feel that yeah Barnes Avenue that's it <laughs> um, Greg was back in his house quite quickly um, so I think he'd had a lot of help from family and he had a mattress on the floor there um, and that was going to be his first night in the mattress. He had a pa one PowerPoint and he had the cat and the dog. He was, he was pretty happy. <laughs> yeah, he was pretty happy. So Lee and Mike Try, um, they used to own the news agency in North Lismore for many years. They live a couple of houses down for it, like love North Lismore. But I did run into Lee the other day and 
they were insured, so the house was all stripped. Um, Mike's health is kind of not good, and because of that, they've decided that they won't take on um, getting the house back together again, that they'll go somewhere else where they can just move into. But um, he ended up in hospital. She ended up in hospital, fell through the roof. Um, he, he said, I, I don't know how she got me through a manhole, but she did. Um, I owe my life to her. So, um, yeah. So health-wise, and, you know, plus she had to kind of bash a hole in, in the wall to get out upstairs. Avanash is here. <laughs> Do you want to say anything? Wait a minute, we'll get a microphone for you. Just in here. Well, the kitchen still looks a bit like that, except I've got a few drawers in there. And um, I've got a fridge back in that hole. And oh, OK. I, but I'm back in my house. I have been since July, and I used the money, I wasn't insured, and nobody pulled anything out of my house. So I dried it and uh, sanded the floors, put 6.6 kVA of solar energy on my roof. My solar hot water still went, and I moved in. Okay. Took the, all my rugs that I'd got from Turkey that were on the top of the wardrobes and laid them all out, and now my house looks pretty good except for a few paint splotches and not very many drawers in the kitchen. Yep, yep. But it looks fine. You'll have to come around for a cup of coffee. I will come around for a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Jan is, is in um, Terrania Street. Um, his house is low set um, and he'd actually taken in a friend and I did have a photo of this but I didn't include it with a tent set up in the bedroom which was, yeah, quite amazing. Um, so, yeah, he was living in, living in a caravan um, I'm not quite sure. I think it's been a struggle. I think it's been a struggle. But it was really lovely that he talked about saving his bus seats and his safari suit. And that's, you know, when people said some things like that, and it wasn't... I just let people talk. Um, that That's that kind of... I've lost everything, but I did find my safari suit. <laughs> You know, or my dad's soccer whistles, or yeah. Susan Johnson was the first person I photographed. She was the one sitting in the car outside her house in Engine Street. Um, I saw them a couple of weeks ago, and um, they're doing well. They're both they're both busy working. They're they're lovely. They've got that beautiful nature about them. They buried three dogs in their back. They they lost they lost three dogs, um, and they built a pergola out the front. They decided to build a pergola out the front amidst everything, and planned a climbing rose because they wanted something beautiful. They were sick of all the trash. So that's another, you know, what we do to move forward. And Darren. Um, oh, he just so matter-of-factly told me, he said, I'm so glad the flood didn't get to that photo. That was his family photo, his mum and dad and his brother. Uh, it looks like it was taken probably in the 80s. Um, yeah, but he lost everything else. But he was glad that that photo got saved. Um, Faye's another one. She was very philosophical. She lives next to Vicky and Mark, who are here. Um, and these are her geisha girls that she, that she made or 
you know, embroidered or whatever. And she was just so happy that it never got them. And um, she was planning on staying. Moving forward, she was insured and nothing was going to stop her. So uh, an amazing woman, yeah. Probably shouldn't have put... Oh, so um, this was um, Karen and, um, and her daughters. <laughs> and um, she describes... I, I can hear the, the screams in the night, but, but not but. They have their two cats and they had a rabbit. And the two cats and the rabbit floated on a mattress for four days. Wow. Like, when the water went, they came down and the cat saved the rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> after, <laughs> after, after all that time. So during the survival mode, they were just quite happy to all be there, but she went, yeah, no, they, they eventually ate the rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> and she came down to the exhibition and she had a wonderful time. She, I think the last time she'd been to Sydney was 12 years ago. Linda and Joe had a dreadful rescue, like just hanging on to the you know, where the electricity, like, just terrible. And their 15-year-old um, dog floated away, which she just feels really... They've relocated to um, Casino. Um, it's been really difficult. It's been really di a, dif a very difficult journey for them. Um, and Marita actually lives in Zadok Street, which normally would never get, never get flood. And um, as you're driving up from the cathedral, it's a, a lower part of the street. Um, and she is insured. Everything has been stripped. And this is the one photo she had, which is now water damage, of her house when she bought it, you know, that you get from a real estate agent. So... Um, yeah, it's kind of sad, yeah. And she's not back in her house. Um, and this couple here loved their garden and they had some friends actually brought, brought down a team of people from, um, from Brisbane. Um, and it was before we had, you know, we had the, the second flood and they, they were working on all this garden, I think, that would have gone during the second one again. But um, they were very much in love, very much loved their home and, yeah, nice they had each other. And Ron actually, um, he's an artist and he lives in Ganella Bar. This is a bit of an exception. Um, and he frequents the Silver Cloud um, Art space, which is um, over, 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 over in Foley's Avenue, it was it was decimated, and that was kind of very much, very much a second home for him. You know, he lives on his own, and um, I loved it, like yeah, I liked his comment too. It, it was climate <laughs> climate change skeptics can be damned. You know, it was yeah. And there would often there's different there's different views on you know like there was no right or wrong during all of this whatever what anyone decided was the cause of all this that was that was fine you know and some of them thought the river needed dredging and some had climate change and etc cetera, etc cetera. so there weren't you know whatever whatever was presented um, yeah Leone lost her Beatles collection, <laughs> which is really sad. Yeah. She's the one who kind of found her dad's referee whistle. Yeah. I think she's planning on staying. And Alan and Vicky Boyle, they're actually in Molesworth Street. Um, and they're really delightful. And they had, this was hanging there, so I thought, oh, well, that's, that's a good one. That's a good one for the, you know, to, to record something different again. And they've moved to 
they've actually bought another house in East Lismore. Yeah. And they're a bit concerned about what will happen with their own house, I think. Yeah. Um, yep. Uh, Brett and Tanya are on off Casino Street on the other side of the ovals there. She's a, she lost all of her artwork. He lost all, he, he had beautiful cameras and I got a photograph of them just because um, we're both kind of Nikon, Nikon people and he had some beautiful collectible, just a pile of mud. Yeah, that was very sad. But he said he'd probably get a different kind of camera now so he was moving forward with that. Um, and Megan actually, um, she had her neighbour on the roof, her sister on a roof, the children had left um, and she's back in her house. And, you know, like that was toward, towards not the early part of what I was doing. So she's got to the stage where she's got a table, a lamp and a bunch of flowers and a, like a PowerPoint. So that, that became and probably still in many places is the case. Um, and Victoria, Victoria's here. Victoria and her mum Val. I don't know whether Victoria wants to say anything. Too shy? Too shy? Okay, all right. <laughs> but their house, um, a beautiful home and it actually just got into not a particularly high level. The house is quite high, but certainly high enough to destroy, destroy things that they had, beds, cupboards, etc. Um, and they lost their horse. Um, I wasn't quite sure whether they'd show this at Parliament House, but they did. <laughs> I was quite expecting them to say... <clears throat> We might not be able to, but they didn't. So, and it's online and everything. Um, this has all now been repainted <laughs> in Union Street. So it's really good I've got that now because it's not there. Um, yes, and the house is for sale. Um, yeah. But that's a perfect example how things change. And Robert's here. Um, and it was really lovely having, having Robert at the exhibition um, and beautiful Molly um, and they made a pact, Robert and his partner and Molly, that they would all demise or they would all get saved. They actually made that pact, which is pretty profound. Um, and Molly has since passed, not because of the flood, but... Um, just a grand old lady. Do you want to say anything, Robert? Hang on, we'll just get you a microphone. And Robert's not a long-time Lismore person either. We were very lucky, my partner and I. Um, my partner, Huey, works out South, Southside Pharmacy. A little plug there. We were lucky. We got back into our home eight weeks after. We got in straight away. Um, we had the... Well, we classified the gay mud army and one straight boy. We got in there and cleaned it all out by the Saturday afterwards. Our walls and our ceilings are all beautiful timber walls. So we, had, we didn't have any chip rock. So therefore, it just helped us. And on, on the outside of our home, it looked like a little old um, you know, fibro home. But underneath that fibro, it was all timber. So the original bill owner of the place covered it with fibro because he didn't want to paint the house and it, was <laughs> and it was grey for years and years and years. So I think that helped us a lot with the saturation of water into our home. It just the fibro helped us out a lot. But we're on top of the, the top of the house, for, um, just at the back there, of, the, of that window for six hours and the people who are our heroes are the Tinnies. They, survived, they rescued us and not just us, many people. And we're just happy that we're, we're alive and we're here today. And mm -hmm. what are we doing? We're staying. We're not going anywhere. OK, lovely. Um, and Chad's Glover, who, um, uh, as it turned out, I, 
I reconnected with Chaz because I knew he's an, a professional art installer. And so he has actually helped me in the November exhibition and the May exhibition. I couldn't have done it without him. Um, and, but that's, that's, you know, like that's forged another, another kind of friendship there. So, uh, um, yeah, that's, that's a lovely thing. He'll come and help me take it down next week. And then we've got Mark and Vicky here, and they're actually becoming quite famous now because of this photo. It's appeared many times, and I guess it is very iconic, the heart, um, and I believe that they might tell you about where they're at now. Vicky, Mark? Um, yeah, and thank you to, again to Jacqueline for having the courage to walk into our home. Um, and it is our home again now. Um, we were only out for three weeks. We were in a caravan until the second flood and then that chased us back upstairs. Our house is looking awesome. Um, we're southies. We're not going anywhere. We're staying where we are. Um, thanks to Mark and family, our house is looking great. Um, but to be a part of this collection has also been... Um, beneficial. I think it's helped us to, to come to terms with it, to be involved with it. I think it's important um, that we are and that we continue to keep for people to see that we're still here and we're not going anywhere. And it's, we're part of history. We're not going to be able to, it's not going to change. So, yeah, it's hard to be in the spotlight. <laughs> For not the right reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, no. Well, it's very iconic, that image. Yeah. 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 And, Thank you. And also a, a difficult rescue. Uh, and two of their daughters also were um, affected by the flood and, and were, were terribly concerned about their mum and dad and unable to do anything. Terribly concerned. Yeah. Yep. Margaret was a bit of a character and she was in kind of a low spot as well, which wouldn't normally, um, you know, get affected by the flood. But uh, uh, she's quite, quite philosophical and, uh, yeah, I think she will stay, yeah. And Gabriel's a lovely young man and he bought his house... Um, in December and it flooded in February, his first home. So that's, that's hard. But he did have insurance because you have to have insurance if you're buying a home. So um, he was one of the ones. But I, don't know. I guess there's a whole story about, you know, whether it was better to be insured or not insured now. So that's, that's another, another aspect of all this. Yep, so um, Kate and Rod, uh, Rod also lost his pizza business in town as well and um, they had COVID as well when I called there that day. <laughs> oh well, <laughs> it's okay. So, uh, but they're, I think they're, they're staying and definitely the neighbourhood um, very much took care of people who were being rescued. Uh, Kerry, uh, she lives over in, I think, um, Kyogle Kyo Street. Yep. And she's been very supportive of what I've been doing, you know, has got back to me, very appreciative. Um, it's a hard road. Yep. So, um, John and... Leone were going to come today. don't think they're here. They've got three generations living in their house. Um, they're over in Charles Street. Um, it's a family home. It belonged to his mum. Very much attached to the home. Beautiful home. Um, they're at odds and ends still as to, as to what they do. Um, yeah, he was a character. <laughs> Um, Nicky Maguire, 
Uh, Nikki had a very tricky rescue. She had casement windows. She had to dive under the water to actually open. You know how the casement, yeah. So she had to dive under, under the water. I uh, had a neighbour screaming from one window. The house is kind of medium set. Um, it's in Dawson Street. She struggled a bit, yeah. Laurie's actually in the Sydney Morning Herald today. And Laurie, this was their 13th pick-up. Um, he's over in North, North Lismore. Um, so that's pick-up number 13, <laughs> which gives you an idea. It was good actually getting that image because um, that one kind of... Um, it just tied things together as to what the... Because when I'd started, um, I just wanted to do people in their homes... This was towards the end, and um, it was it was quite fortuitous, I think, to just have that one image that gave a sense of the street. Um, Tim actually rang me from. Um, he said he's he's really transient now. He lives in Little Keene Street, and uh, he was going to the exhibition last week. Um, so I'm not quite sure where he is in the world, but uh, um, a lovely man. And, and very much new to Lismore. I think we're nearly finished with the photos. Uh, Victoria's here. Um, Victoria owns a beautiful house in Simmons Street. I don't know whether she wants to say anything. That would be not. Yep. Thanks. Well, I've been offered money and I'm in a dilemma now of what do I do with this beautiful home that is, was built for floods. It all has fretwork and I've put all the timbers back into it. It didn't it handled the flood. But I don't know where my life's going. I don't know whether to move the house to where. Pay half a million dollars for a block of land. Or do I go and buy another home and leave this beautiful home there, standing? So I think a lot of people are in the same boat as myself at the moment. And it's tricky. Thanks, Jacqueline. That's OK. Thank you, Victoria. And it is a beautiful home. They're all beautiful homes. Um, Helen's home was basically down near a boral. Yeah. And this is actually tar. Oh. So, and they're just having a, um, an ongoing, ongoing battle with, with um, yeah, an absolute nightmare. Her and um, her neighbour, Marion. Um, but you, can, you can't get that off. And it's not just outside. Um, yeah, kind of speaks for itself, that one. I should move closer to the microphone, OK? Um, this is Leah. She lives in Terrania Street and she was putting cardboard up on the walls because when I took this photo, it was starting to get a bit cooler. It was towards the end of the project. But she said, ah, it's great for the kids to draw on. <laughs> um, yeah, but she had a, she had a story where she um, had her three children. The oldest was 14. Um, they were on the roof with two dogs. They couldn't take everyone at once. And it was during, during light hour, daylight hours. Um, so her, she, left with, she left with the two younger children and her 14-year-old stayed on the roof with the dogs to go in the next pickup. And as soon as she left, she went, what have I done? I've actually left my 14-year-old on a roof. Um, and she really grappled with... She really grappled with that, even you know. And her daughter was reassuring, but that that would be you can yeah, yeah. So that became a um, a big issue. And Judy and Graham are here. Oh, do you, well, Judy and Graham are staying. They have a beautiful home in Frank Street. They've had it for many decades. They bought it to have their first daughter in, which they did. So you might like to say something, 
Judy or Graham? Tell me if I'm going too slow. Is it all good? Um, except for the slight problem with the flood, we've had nothing but good luck ever since. Um, oh. <laughs> um, we were fortunate enough not to be insured, um, so therefore the house is totally intact. Um, and in fact, we've repaired it to a more original state and it's better than ever. And our biggest threat to us at the moment is that the NRRC um, would like to buy us out and we don't want to. So <laughs> it's just a different threat. <laughs> what do you but mean a threat? Uh, they could compulsory resume the house. Oh. Oh. Um, so we don't, we don't feel threatened by a future flood, but we feel threatened by the, um, the government, actually. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well. Did someone else want to say something then? No? I was just asking what the NRC stands for. Is that a government? Oh, and they can tell you what to do. Um, this is Rahima. She's actually the one she got on her roof. Um, and then noticed smoke coming out of the gutters and her house court was on fire um, as floodwaters as she was sitting on, on her roof. Amazing, like, wow. And it was the, the, the gentleman in a um, liquor uh, fabrications who made glass who actually saved, saved her, you know, underwater in a boat all that kind of stuff. Um, so her house was actually destroyed by fire. Um, I, think, I think that's how the insurance may have worked for her. Yeah, she's an artist, beautiful girl. Mm. It's since been demolished. She did. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a bit, you know. But I guess if there's smoke coming from the gutter, like, um, and there and there were people who took photos of that, which is great. There was there was footage of that, so that's really important. Uh, Layla, absolute character, lives in um, Molesworth Street on the other side of Ballina Road, and um, yeah, she's she's just quite a character. Lives on her own, really resourceful. She was insured. Uh, yeah, just very much, very much a, a Lismore person. Oh, we've we've, been, we've done that one. You got a second go, Robert. <laughs> and Harper. Um, Harper is a uh, young guy. He lives in a low-set house. It's gorgeous. It's like it's solid as like a colonial, early colonial house. And um, but interestingly, um, um, in my in my dealings with Janelle Safin, like last week um, when it was setting up at Parliament House, she said to me, um, "No, Harper will be da Harper will be there to to kind of help you when you." get down to Palm. And I thought, that's amazing. I know two Harpers now. <laughs> and when I got down there, it's him. He's actually now working with Janelle. Oh, right. So, uh, oh, that's right. Yeah. So that's, um, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, yeah, lovely, lovely fellow. And, and wants to, he wants to move his house. The house is low. It needs to be raised. But I think he wants to move that, he's quite keen to move the house to higher ground, but stay in Lismore. And, um, this is Jack, who lives next door to Skimmo's. Jack has been there forever. And, and Jack is of it's because they didn't dredge the, the river. He's, you know, of that. He's not going anywhere. Um, but I loved, like, his, his neatly, like, iron trousers on the wall. And, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very proper. Gorgeous man. Reminded me of Al Pacino. Couldn't... <laughs> I couldn't stop looking at him. Um, 
And Hamish is a beautiful young man. He'd spend a lot. He lives in Terrania Street up on the left. He'd raised his home. Um, he'd done a lot of work and he, he was actually shattered by what had happened. He hasn't long had his first home. I hope he's okay. Yep. He's an apiarist. Yep. And oh, we've had that one. Sorry. And then Marion is also affected by the next to the Boral uh, look. And also the whole inside of her house is... Um, even her teddy bear. Yeah. Yeah. Just profound. Really profound. Um, that's the house next door, the other one that belonged to Helen. Yep. But she's still like, see, Marion's got her heart on. And, um, and Kerry and Philip are here. And they're down the very end of Casino Street. And they look out onto kind of bushland like you look out on here. And, and they love their home. And they've pretty much got it back together. And I don't know whether you'd like to say something. Yep. Yeah. And that's probably the best thing you could have done. Yeah. Yeah. And Jo, she, she has got... Her house has really risen to the ultimate height um, in uh, South Lismore. And she described it as anyone would look at a house. If the flood ever got in, if the flood ever got in there, we're all doomed. Well, it did. It didn't. It got up to, well, you can sort of see where it got up to. Um, but she was, she was kind of back in her house, and uh, and I think it's still grappling. But it's really high, really high. Yep. And I think that's it. <laughs> so. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, um, do you think it would be nice to hear from someone from Terrania yeah, Cree? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. As to how... Yeah, sure. Would, would be really nice, um, I think, for um, those that have come from Lismore and myself and everyone else, if there's someone from Terrania Creek who could actually or tell... Tuntable. Or Tuntable. Yeah. Sorry? I'd like to speak briefly. Yeah, just, just yeah, to no, no, kind no, no, of, um, no, no, no. because... And Nicole has a poem. Yep. So does Rebecca. Okay, then. But I, I think it would be nice to include... Uh, and I'm just a little bit concerned because there were some people here who have gone. I know that was pretty well known for people that were okay. differently affected and younger people who I couldn't get to come here. Today. That's okay. Yeah. That's, um, oh, they might be so working I just want to as well. A little bit about looking out for people still, because a lot of people are still really suffering, and I think it was really shocking, especially for younger people. I had I it was almost impossible to get younger people to come today, um, which I think is pretty sad. But I also had a friend who. Um, committed suicide a month or so ago from Lismore, who um, was rescued while he was hanging on to his guttering, which was starting to break in the full force of the flood. Um, he was rescued by his neighbour who pushed him up onto the roof where he sat all night and listened to the screams of his other neighbours. And uh, he was a musician. He was only 
little guy, very gentle, very reserved. Um, and while he had helped to fix up the house he'd been renting for 32 years, I think after a year it was just all too much for him and he decided to walk out. So I, he was a folk musician and part of a, a circle of my friends who play folk music and all I could think of to do for him was to uh, write a small, just a really short tune. Um, so I'm not really speaking about my experience, although I had a landslide one side and my neighbour's place the other side got washed down 30 metres into the paddock and I'm not sure if he's here. Uh, we had no deaths and we didn't lose any people, which I think is the hardest thing in all of this. And I just wanted to actually, before I play this piece, I, f I have a really strong feeling that our society these days, and ever since the Industrial Revolution, is kind of defined more by the cracks in it. Um, our system of governance, our social systems, don't really work all that well. And one thing that did come out after the flood was the amazing amount of creativity and humanity that poured into those cracks that we usually try to fill up with stuff, and we're encouraged to totally by our culture. Um, and it's just remembering that ongoing because for some, a lot of people, the flood hasn't finished, the, the landslide damage that's, yeah, has, has, has not finished and won't be finished for quite some time and that we still need to keep looking out for people. And this is in, rem in memory of my friend, Pete. Um, I'm just wondering if Rebecca would like to come up and say her poem. And while she's coming, we're going to aim to try and eat at quarter to one just so that the kitchen knows what we're doing. So we, we won't be too long, but we'd love to hear Rebecca's song. And she had a lot of trouble too. Um, I was... My kids and I had a rental over in East um, during the flood, so we... Um, we had two metres of water through our house. Um, and after probably, like lots of you guys, um, it was really overwhelming, the um, journalists all contacting me, asking for my flood story. And because I'm a poet, people um, wanting flood poems. And, um, you know, I was kind of just busy throwing all my life onto the curb and trying to wash all the mud off what I was left with. and not really able to form words very well. And I was thinking, what would I, what would I write anyway to tell people what, what this is like? And, um, but eventually, a few weeks later, the poems did start to come and um, this was the first one, um, fittingly for something called After the Deluge. It's called um, After the Water. I can't write you a flood story. The ones I would write it for already know the way blood becomes mud, moves thickly, slowing our limbs. The way mud becomes blood, the gout of our houses, road after road of hearts emptied into the street. If you weren't there, how can I tell you that the sky can fall like a hammer? The way a town buckles beneath it, how to clutch your children in the violent dark. I don't know the words for this sound that remains of water roaring into water. 
how to tell you your room can close like a fist, that forever your eyes will search for the gaps in its grip. I can tell you of salvage, that a camp for chest of photos will float, that in the bloated carcass of a bathroom, the cardboard artwork of a woman's face remains unmoved two metres below the waterline. I can tell you of courage, that an old dog can live for a day in a tree, that a man can laugh and pass you a flask while you hold for him the moment his roof became a raft, while you hold for him the moment his esky was a boat that he hoped was enough to carry his tiny daughter if the roof tiles should go under. I can tell you this, that the hewn pine of a 200-year-old piano smells as fresh under the chainsaw as it did the day the tree that gave it dropped, that when its long-held panels give way, your childhood will hang in the dank and the loss, and from its frame a snake it has saved will slide out over your warm and living hand. There's something in that I'm still learning to understand. But what can I tell you, you who live on ground that's still solid, how to count your front steps like the breaths you have left and watch the river take them, how to beg inside a deluge, that the pocket of oxygen where you exist is not fixed, that you have to climb after it, from the table to the bench top till it sticks beneath the rafters where you stay and pray for the rain to stop while your foothold shifts, while the fridge tips, while a framed photograph of your parents rises like a fish beside your elbow. That you live here after the rescue. I can't write you a flood story. There is nothing left to know except this that when the world comes to take herself back, we can't choose what we hold. That eyes are not windows, they're levee walls. And that dawn in a broken garden still outlines every dying leaf with gold. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. I heard that poem once before in the Nimbin World Poetry Cup and, yeah, it's quite something, isn't it? And really moving. It really expresses what you've all been through so well. Would anybody else like to share anything? And then, yeah, and then we'll have a little bit of music from Luke to finish. Oh, hi, everybody. Most Nimbin people would know me. Um, my name's Nicole. Um, I've lived in the Tunnable Valley for... How old are you, Cedar? 25 years? 24? She's going to turn 25 for 20... Yeah, for 25 years. Um, and our experience out here in the hills was quite different to... Well, you know, some people... Lot, well, my neighbour lost her home. I didn't lose my home. What? My experience was what I could describe as earth grief, or somebody's coined a phrase, solastalgia, like nostalgia, but it's, it's this sort of, this, it's like a climate change grief. Um, and where the landslides happened, a bit closer, sorry. So where the landslides happened was where it was burnt in 2019. <laughs> where the fire got stopped, the Mount Nadi fire um, event. So yeah, this, so this is how I process. I, I've got this really hectic video of the landslide going past. It's really, I, all I can do is describe it as like earth lava. Okay, and this is how I process that experience and I work at the neighbourhood centre in town. So, I went straight from that experience straight into helping everybody else with their experience, um, you know, in a crisis sort of situation, in a recovery situation. So, yeah, so this is all that was going on for me in that time. So, post landslide, Cedar Farm, Young Road, Tunnable Creek. 
Thursday, 17th of March, 2022, 3 a.m. It's 3 a.m. again. I know, I checked my phone. It was 1.15 moments ago as I stare at the screen, scrolling, scrolling, flood pick, war pick, COVID news. Oh my God, what is that ScoMo saying now? 3 a.m. is the reflection hour. I am not alone, it seems. Robin is active. Nick, too. Ashoka, Ella, Marie, Hannah, Liz, Patricia, too. What are they thinking? Or avoiding? It's a bit rude to ask at 3 a.m. Oh, shit, it's 4 a.m. My story for today is forming. Do I post that video or not? It's pretty intense. What is the purpose? Is the intention good? This urge to share, to pry, to understand my world, my friends, myself? Why did I film it? I'm hooked in, I know that. I clutch my phone, my safety line that started as an extended baby monitor. Are they okay? Where are they? I'm glad they weren't here. As light arrives, I reflect on the structures that are gently and violently crumbling around me in my town, my country, our world and here. I am still rudderless on that sea of mud, exhausted, waterlogged, heart pounding, as I once again scream, the forest, the forest. No smoke this time as a muddy giant drifts past. Then it arrives, the chaos of mud and rock and ridge in liquid form, an earth eruption a quickening, surging, forest-filled sacrifice. In desperation, I seek shelter, Shift, sift through the debris. Each rock, each uprooted tree, each branch has a language written all over it. Scribbled lines, smudged, rubbed, scratched and burnt. It makes no sense. I don't understand. I've forgotten this landscape so familiar, made strange. Frantically fossicking, searching, turning each stone, each branch, each moment, every, every interaction, 20 years plus or more of them, desperate to decipher the language, the meaning, some sense of my place in this foreign, familiar landscape. I sink deep in the mud. It grips. It holds. I do not struggle, yet out I climb again and again, reaching, grabbing, searching, yearning in wonder, in fear, in awe of her power. I am merely her creature. I witness nature at war. Dira One and the Rainbow Snake fought as they carved this land, this country, this place. I am witness. I am witness to their new battle as wind and earth and water seek to balance the land ravaged by fire. It must be found. It is all still here, present in this new landscape, that battle I witnessed. It's here somewhere, some understanding of this new world, this new story of the land, this new language my mother is desperately trying to teach me. Her story is laid bare in the gully before me, layer upon layer ancient rock in waiting, a barren moonscape waiting, waiting to become soil, then forest once again. My story isn't special. It is unique. It is true. It is my story to feel, to make sense of, to share, to translate. Desperately, I rearrange the rocks, her messages, mother, your signs, your gifts, the pain, my children, my life, the forest. My body slows. Stillness. As the mud settles, I can explore the creek, enjoy beauty once again. My children groan, rock hop ahead, treasure hunting, laughing with gold fever until they are out of sight. I am transported, relaxed by gentle sun and forest lullaby. The mud, it sparkles, crystal-filled river sand, a sedimentary spectrum of ochre with every colour, every shape present. The forest giant looks at home here in its new habitat, settling in alongside the scattered sandpaper figs, the holders of the old creek bed, battle rage, 
yet still standing. I find a tiny crystal egg with tints of iridescent blue, the colour of the creek now. No moneyed water or thoughts. The language of this old, new landscape begins to make some sense. Each scribbled line and mark take on a semblance of order, rearranging until I see it in ochre, written on a rock in plain English with a child's clarity I can't ignore. Home. This has all happened before. My story, her story, history. These changes are our mother's normal, her cycles. We are guilty, but she will be okay. The forest will be okay. It is me, it is us, it is we that are not okay. We have forgotten. As the shape of my story becomes clearer, you speak to me, you tell me. This is your story, this is their story, this is our story. No more loud rumbling, cracking and crunching. I hear the gentle sound of the ever-present little creek. I get a sense of a new story. All that we are and all that we owned is jumbled up and buried or is out to sea. It is all still here. It has nowhere else to go. It's time some structures crumble. She whispers, we are one, each with a story. My story, your story, their story, our story. I can heal. The land, it heals. You can heal. We can heal. I hope our leaders are listening too. Thanks. Um, I live on the same community as Nicole and um, was impacted uh, when the landslide went through the middle of the backyard and under the house and I was in it and I woke up to this eerie silence and then I went out to have a look and I could see that things had significantly changed. There was a tree in the middle of the backyard and foliage at the edge of the veranda and boulders everywhere and a lot of rubble and but the garden was still there, a veggie garden and so on and I thought I'd move my son's car but there was a landslide behind it so I went back inside and went well what do I do now and then I could feel the house more going on and it was three o'clock in the morning and pitch dark and no power so I went out to have a look and all the gardens were gone. It was up the back steps. It was the veggie garden gone and over the edge. And it was like, what do we do with this? What do we do now? And fortunately, my son wasn't sleeping in the bus in the backyard on the other side of the landslide, but was up in the top room. So I woke him and we evacuated and went down to another house. And, um, and then in the time that followed, it was... It was so hard to see, it had been burnt around there and after the fires recovery happened, but the landslide didn't recover the same and it was, it was pretty grim and I just would sit there on the back steps which we'd cleared and, you know, wonder what solid was or what, what anything was anymore because it had all changed so much. And then I heard about, I did go into Lismore and clean a couple of places, one very near the Borrell place, which was terrible, um, but another one, um, a friend's ginormous house up there, and you just wonder going up there how it could have got up there. It was, you know, so like I totally credit what you've all been through in Lismore, phenomenal. And there was a service, there were a couple of services helping people, as you all know, the Koori Mail and the Koori Mail Wellbeing Team, and you may have heard of the Northern Rivers Community Healing Hub. Um, I went in to um, support that space and um, last year I, I volunteered all through the rest of the year holding space there for that service to exist and, and this year I, um, I'm, I'm um, able to be paid to be there and I just wanted to let you all know about this um, opportunity to, there's, to come and get some relief and some trauma out of the body, some grounding to land out of the 
you know, the fight, flight, trauma response and to come back into feeling okay and safe in your body. The world might not be a safe place, but in your body is. There is safety in there and landing, dropping down into the parasympathetic, getting some relief. There's bodywork sessions three days a week, Monday, Wednesday and Thursday, and they're free. Fundings come from outside to support this service. It's a service based on Indigenous um, ways of being, and um, so it's, it's a really beautiful, nourishing space, and I just want you to know that it exists, and if you can share that information with the people in your... Yeah, um, because it's, on, it's still there, and the need is still there, and the chance to receive some care and some healing... Um, it's so worthy. And there's also weaving if you have time to come and sit and let the world go by and <laughs> connect with others. And, um, um, or if there's something to explore, there's expressive creative art therapy sessions, uh, one-to-one or in a group. And it's a really beautiful space. So I just wanted to come and um, share that. Um, while Luke's coming up just to sing us one song before we go off to lunch, um, I'd like to thank Paul's brother, Roger, who died, and um, his wife and our sister-in-law wanted to sponsor something at the Aquarius Festival, and they chose this. So this is in the loving memory of Roger. watching those pictures. Thank you, Jacqueline. And uh, thank you, everyone, for sharing. I, uh, I'll sing a peaceful and um, gentle song. I, I, I do have some angry songs, but um, about the, but I will. I do play both kinds of music. But I'll just play something peaceful and gentle to finish, so thank you. Shall pass, this too shall end. 
It's been a beautiful, beautiful day, and thank you all for coming, and enjoy a beautiful lunch. Paul and I mightn't be here at the end of it because we've got to go uptown, but please have a lovely lunch, and I hope you've had a lovely day, and thank you all for coming and for everybody's work and offerings. Thank you.